Turn it for good. 
no better song for this time. God, that whatever the enemy throws at us, you turn it for good. Same arrows the enemy shoots at us to take us down, you turn those arrows around back at the enemy. God, and we know in all things you've made us more than conquerors. And we will see a victory as we move forward today. In your name, Jesus. Good morning, Rock Point Church. What a beautiful time of worship we just had, and now we're coming into time for the Word. It's going to be an awesome Word. We're continuing our series at table. Also, just want to make note that we are just about at the end of Phase 1, and coming into our Phase 2, it's going to look a little different in a really good way. Now, of course, everything that we do is completely dependent upon the announcements that are made by the state of Oregon, so we do wait for that. But if all goes according to plan, then we'll be entering phase two next week. And this is how church is going to look next week. We'll be able to have our building open again and gathering once again in person together. And I'm super excited about that. It's not going to be, of course, with everybody all together at once. But what we're going to do is open up for two services and have seats already spread throughout the whole sanctuary, which they've been set up now. We've been measuring carefully. So we have nice little groupings. Your family can come and sit on one side. We can have singles, we can have couples, and we're gonna move everybody, and they're all socially distanced and seated in such a way that we can put 75 people in the sanctuary. And then we'll take a break in between after that, disinfect our common surfaces, and then we'll have our second service with the same amount of people again, 75 allowed into that gathering as well. And we're going to try that out and see how it goes. And I think it'll just be really awesome to be able to see some of each other's faces, to worship together, and take part in a live service. But having said all that, I do want to just make you aware that we are going to continue doing online services and you are free to make the choice that is right for you for your family and we just support you in that and we're excited to offer both live and online services and we're going to still do our online service for those of you who prefer to stay home that's going to be there and we will wave to you and say hello and make you feel as much part of us as we possibly can so we want you to just be in prayer about that talk to your family members make that choice and know that if you do choose to come to the church that we're going to do everything within our ability to make sure that our church is safe and comfortable and welcoming and flows with the phase two plan that the Oregon government has set out for us. So another good thing for youth though is, as you know, the youth have already been meeting because they've been having groups of 25, but they are gonna shake it up a little bit this week. And so on Wednesday, instead of doing our middle school and then our high school, we're doing something different and the girls are gonna meet first. So girls, you're gonna meet at six o'clock until 7.30. Then there's going to be a break in between and then guys you're going to come at eight o'clock and you're going to meet for the next half of that group and so we're going to just shake it up do something fun keep it fresh keep it exciting if you have any other questions make sure you just send a message to pastor thomas and melissa and you can get all the information there as for our kids on the rock we will not be doing kids on the rock while we have our live in the church building services we're going to continue doing those online as well and so kids i want you to still tune in and watch the lessons that come online for you and then also don't forget that right after this service here you're going to be zooming okay so as soon as church is over the boys are going to zoom with daniel moltop and then after that the girls are going to zoom with colleen moltop at 11:45. As for our tithes and offerings, I just again want to thank you for your generous giving. We have not wanted in any way, and we've been able to do some really cool things to bless people too. We've been able to bless people in our congregation financially, and we've also been able to bless our community. And we've had a group of ladies together putting together care packages for some of our nursing homes and retirement homes 
who are really shut, locked in at this time. And just being able to reach out in some practical ways. It's been really awesome. So I thank you for giving and just want to encourage you to go online and do that. Or if you would rather mail your checks, you can mail your checks to 4301 North College, New Oregon 97132. Or you can go right through the church website and do it online. So thank you very much for your generous giving. And we're going to have a great word from Pastor Jeff in just a moment here. Just remember, next week, 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock, text me or email me and let me know which service you would like to sign up for so we can ensure that we meet the right quota. God bless you. Good morning, church. Happy Pentecost Sunday. And I just want to greet everybody, and I'm looking forward to seeing everybody on next Sunday and as we seat for about 84 to 90 people. It's just going to be great just to see everybody and have a few amens coming back at me as I preach the word. Let's turn in our Bibles uh, tonight uh, to the Gospel of John and John chapter 12. Uh, but before I do that, I want to read a couple of scriptures. And the first one's out of Psalm 33.1. And it says these words, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. And then Psalm 147.1 says these words, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is beautiful. And this morning I want to talk about at table, uh, conversations with Jesus. I'm going to talk about worship, the area of worship. And here in the Psalms, he's talking about worship or praise is beautiful. It's just not good. It's just not a, a moral ethic. Hey, this is right and you better praise the Lord. It, it is the idea of beautiful. It's lovely. There is a picture of artistic. It's like a beautiful painting that has many colors on it and many layers. Uh, and then the painter goes to work on it with all the hues and creates a beautiful, beautiful uh, picture. And in the same way, when we gather together and we're, we're, we're worshiping in our houses together, uh, there is just a uh, overlap and beautiful display of God's grace and his mercy. It is beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. And I just want to repeat this phrase, and this is sort of my main thought today. It's a beautiful thing when the worth of Jesus and the love of his followers match. And I want to say that again. It is a beautiful thing that when the worth of Jesus and the love of his followers match. Now, let me read from John, the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of them who was reclining with him at table. Mary therefore took a pound, and which would be equivalent to about 11 ounces or 12 ounces in the uh, Hebrew measurements, about the size of a pop can of expensive ointment made from pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his, her, his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And he said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having a charge of money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you, but you do not always have me. Here's my first point, and I got a number of points today. And the first one is, hey, make Jesus the guest of honor. And so they gave, it says in verse 2, they gave a dinner for him. 
there and Martha was served, Lazarus was one of the, them reclining on the t table. And so we see Martha once again, she is serving uh, Jesus. And it, it's like a uh, celebration, it's a sort of a Thanksgiving meal, an appreciation dinner, it's a, where Jesus is the honored guest. Martha is serving Jesus or loving Jesus through serving. It is not a negative here. And also, you see um, uh, Martha later on in this story, and she will uh, break open the, 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 the flask and just spread it on Jesus. She serves him through in an area of worship. And then you see Lazarus. And Lazarus never says a word. He's like that quiet man who sometimes comes to church and he never uh, says a word. But here he was, he was exhibit A because he had ra been raised from the dead. And so he was just, he's standing there. And But the guest of honor here is Jesus as it's the table is sort of in a U shape, a low table. They're reclining at it, they're at table. And they're having that fellowship and that conversation. And there they are, but Jesus, it, this, this banquet is for Jesus. It's to honor him and everything that he had done. Now, I want to think about a, a worship service. You know, you could have the best band, the best singers, you could have the best lighting show, but if you don't have Jesus in the middle of that worship service, you don't have anything. You could have people uh, talking and complaining about certain things and uh, about the government, about their given situations that they have. But if they don't put it, Jesus in the center, what they have is a bunch of complaining about their situations and complaining about their government. They do not have Jesus being the guest of, the, uh, guest of honor. Jesus is the reason for the party. We worship him. We honor him. We give him praise. We give him glory with everything we have. You know, the, there, there it is. There's Lazarus is in the middle. And Mark 14 also tells you that this uh, banquet was done in the house of Simon the leper. And once again, I don't want everybody to be confused about uh, Luke 7, where there was another Simon, a Simon the Pharisee, and there was a sinful woman. This Mary isn't that sinful woman, and this is not Mary Magdalene, because Mary the Magdalene was from Magdala, and Mary uh, was, this Mary is from Bethany. We've got some very common names here. It's like Jim, it's like Tim, and uh, they're very well known, even as Mary or uh, Martha. Mary would be a very common name, even today, we, we would have that. But uh, here we have Lazarus, and we just have a, a, here he has come from death to life. Here they are celebrating the fact that Lazarus has risen from the dead. Hey, hold it, wait a minute here. I know some other people who have risen from death to life, or from, from death, yeah, death to life. You know, that they, who, God who is rich in his mercy, has made us alive and has seated us with him in heavenly places. You know, even right now, as you're in your living rooms and different places that you're watching, you are a trophy of grace. You are an ob object of God's divine affection. And he has put his hand on you and he has taken you from a place where you were absolutely dead in your sins and your trespasses. And through your trust and through your belief in Jesus Christ, Jesus is, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever would believe in me should, should not he die, and yet he, shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. See, when Jesus, six days to the Passover here, and he's, he's going to be uh, crucified, then he's going to be buried, and then he is going to rise again. And when he rose again, that power of that resurrection was the beginning of new creation life for all people. When people began to put their trust in him and began to surrender their life and recognize him as their king in their life, his life became their life inside of them. He came and lived inside of them and he gave them new life. 
And that is the beauty and, uh, of a grace that we all share and celebrate in. And then also there was a leper there. And, you know, he had this infectious skin disease and th that made him an outcast. But Jesus somehow it doesn't say here in this narrative or in Mark 14, but it's somewhere along the way he's cleansed as a leper. He's healed. Here's this guy who was an outcast, is brought into the co covenant co community of God. And maybe today you feel, I am an outcast. I don't belong anywhere. I want you to hear today. Jesus wants to touch our, li our life by the blood of Jesus. He wants to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, cleanse us and bring us into his family. Jesus' arms are wide open. We are all the objects of his grace. You know, we just want to celebrate and worship that today. But moving on in verse 3. I, I, this is my third point here is don't be a dabbler, okay? Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the per perfume. Here, enter Mary here. And th this is her gift. He, even as Martha, her gift was serving. And even as Lazarus, he was the host of the meal. And uh, he provided that. Here is Mary's gift to Jesus. You know, and perhaps they pooled together as a family and got this all together. Um, some even feel it was like a family heirloom that it could have been. Or even something that could have been used for one of the, those girls when they got married. A perfume that they would use even on their, their wedding. And, uh, but Mary therefore took that, that pound or that uh, 11 ounces of perfume. And, and Mary could have easily just opened the flask a little bit and began to take it and just trickle a little ointment on Jesus. And, you know, hey, Jesus, a little dab will do you. A little, a little love will show, be okay. A little affection will be okay. You know, I, you know, I really don't want to get too carried away. And he, just some moderation here. I just a measured response of everything that you've done. Oh, you've raised my brother from the dead, you know, and you've just done wonders in our family. But, hey, I just got a little bit here for you. You know, Mark 14 says that she broke the flask and she poured it out on Jesus. Something had so impacted her. The love of Christ had so come upon her that her love led to extravagant worship. You know, love always gives. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. God so loved the world that he gave. There is a giving. And here, here's the challenge for all of us when it comes to, out of our affection of all the good things that God has done to, for us, all the grace, all the mercy he has shown in our life, and he continues to show to us, is that we need to break the flask. We need to pour out our love on Jesus. Don't be a dabbler. Don't be a trickler. Don't be one who just gives a little, little, and a little. Be a pourer or a lavisher. Be one of generous generosity, gracious generosity. Let's smash the lids off of uh, conservativeness, reservedness, and politeness. People, okay, imagine next Sunday when we're all together. Surprise your wife, okay? That you are actually a just a lavish worshiper. And those who sit around you in church without, uh, yeah, be, being pretty good. But be, <laughs> in Psalm 9-1, it says, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of your marvelous works. That idea of the whole heart is with the, the, the heart, with me. One spirit, spirit to spirit. You're connecting with the Lord, but also mind to mind. It is like you're, you're thinking of the words of God as you're worshiping and singing. And also then you're uh, connecting your uh, body and you're saying, hey, everything, Lord, belongs to you. If you need me to sing or, or dance or shout or lift my hands, Lord, I am willing to do that. I am worshiping you with my whole heart. And I like this one, Psalm 1111, Psalm 111.1. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. 
in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation I will praise him. You know, the, the challenge uh, that I had when I was a teenager, um, I remember just God talking to me and this God's spirit really working and instructing me. He said, hey, whatever the worship leader does, however the worship leader does, follow that. So if the, the worship leader was clapping or dancing or singing, bowing, you know, any of those expressions of worship, I say, I made a commitment to the Lord. And I think that should be in our heart, each and every one of our hearts, is that we'll say, God, hey, whatever, however, I just want to lavishly pour out my praise, my worship, my love, my affection for you with everything I have. Now, here's the fourth one we point here. Worship has a fragrance. Right at the end of verse three, it says, the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, there are times I go into my house and Karen's cooking and, uh, you know, and the fragrance, the smell of food comes out. And, you know, I especially love roast beef, potatoes, gravy, all that. But when I get that smell, it's like, mmm, I am in heaven. You know, that there is a beautiful smell that goes on there. Also, there are times when Karen wears perfume you know, there is a beautiful scent and I, it is, it is well pleasing. That's that scent. And when Mary broke that fat flask, a scent filled the room. And when we worship the Lord, there is a fragrance that fills the room. There is a change, an unseen change in the atmosphere that you are in. And there is a new fragrance that happens. You know, in John 11, when Jesus was uh, um, uh, went to Lazarus, who was in the grave at the time, and it was four days after he'd been buried, and the, the word was to, to the Lord, said to him, Behold, as the King James Version puts it, he stinketh. You know, there, there is a smell of death. But when you come to worship, there is a, a fragrant smell that changes the, the, the stinking atmosphere. There is, you know, in um, Leviticus uh, chapters 1 through 6, there are five Le Levitical offerings. These are the sacrifices that would always be offered up at the tabernacle. And they would, they would have the sin offering, they would have the burnt offering, they would have the peace offering, they would have the trespass offering, and they would have also the meal offering. Well, there is a little line that goes at the end of all of those, and it says, when they offered those, it was a sweet aroma to the Lord. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. When people had sinned, okay, and committed a transgression to the Lord, they weren't walking with the Lord, when they offered that sin offering, it's like when there was forgiveness of that sin, there was a sweet smell. It was pleasing to the Lord. And when they did the peace offering, which was when somebody broke covenant relationship with the community, there would be a sweet aroma. When there was a burnt offering, which was a picture of them dedicating themselves to the Lord, offering themselves up, up to the Lord completely, like Romans 12, 1 says, I, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. And in a, an acceptable sacrifice, it's a sweet aroma to the Lord when you say, God, hey, you can have all of me. I am going to 100% belong to you. And in the same way, when there was trespass offerings, and trespasses dealt with dealing with right relationships with one another on a vertical plane. And when those right relationships were off and they, they did a trespass offering, it says those trespass offerings, there was a sweet aroma. And here's what happens. When you get right with people that there's been wrongs to, and maybe it's restitution or asking for forgiveness, there is something, there's a fragrance, and it actually smells well. It's pleasing unto the Lord. 
And then there, there's a last uh, sacrifice they would give there in Leviticus was the meal offering. And the meal offering was a representation as an agricultural uh, economy. And they would give, give their grains to the Lord and for, from the work of their hands. And so for us, you know, that's our time. That's our, our skills and our giftings. And it's also our resources. And we're saying, hey, Lord, this belongs to you as well. Lord, I am, I'm going to serve you with what I got. Okay, God, I'm going to give that unto you as well. And you know what God says on that one? He says, hey, that's a sweet aroma. Hey, those sacrifices, those sacrifices of our service and our sacrifices that we make in relationships and our sacrifices that we enjoy with what Jesus has done, they're well-pleasing unto the Lord. And when we pour out our life, when we pour out our sacrifice and our worship unto the Lord, hey, that there is a unseen change of the atmosphere. I know at times I've gone into churches where there's uh, some bickering or some division. It, the air sort of stinks. But then you can come back to that place when there is unity, there's harmony and relationships, things have been worked out. Hey, there's something that has changed in the air. And God wants us to know that there is a fragrance. Worship has a fragrance and we pour out our lives. Here's the, here's the next one. Um, don't rob Jesus' honor. In uh, John 12, 4 to 6, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So we have this uh, offering, as it were, by, um, by Mary to Jesus, where she pours out the oil. And Judas all of a sudden begins to speak up and he says, hey, that could have been sold for 300 denarii. Now, everybody knows what 300 denarii is. Well, it really what it is, is a laborer's day's wage is a denarii. So this is about a year's wage for a low earner. So this could be anywhere from $25,000 to $50,000, somewhere in that zone. And Judas is looking at this and he's saying, hey, you, you know what? This could have been given. All of this money could have been used. And in Mark 14, 4, it says these words. Why was the ointment wasted like that? Why was it wasted? And I want us all to hear this line. And this is an excellent line. Nothing poured out on Jesus is ever wasted. Nothing poured out on Jesus is too costly. Anything that we give to the Lord is an act of worship. It's not just the money. It's, the, it's a service and worship to the Lord. You know, maybe you're, you're watching this um, online today and you've served in other churches and you say, Lord, was that a waste? Hey, God says, no, your, your acts of service and of costly sacrifice, hey, I've taken note of every one of those. Maybe you've done mission work at different places or you're a missionary yourself. God wants you to hear that not, not any of your labors, anything that you are giving yourself to, even presently, is not being wasted. Maybe you were a pastor before and you feel, well, I'm no use anymore. Hey, God says, hey, all the service, all the labor, all the love that you have done is not wasted. And it is of all great importance unto him. And how they respond, and we see... Uh, we see Mary and we see Judas and we see a value, how they value Jesus. Mary loved Jesus. Judas loved money. Mary's heart treasured Jesus. Judas's heart denied that Jesus was the treasure. And the opposite of a spirit of abandoned, extravagant worship is a spirit of betrayal. Well, hey, what was it worth it? You know, someday we're going to be 
all in heavenly, heavenly realm. And there, there's Mary, and all of a sudden we'll be introduced to her, and we're going to ask her, Mary, hey, was it worth it that day? You're in that room and with all those other people, and you put out that 300 denarii, 300 day wages, uh, that oil on top of Jesus. Hey, Mary, really? Was that service? Was that sacrifice? Was it worth it? Well, the answer to that one comes in Revelation. In Revelation uh, 5, 12, we read these words. First, uh, someone's crying out and they say, and they're weeping and say, who can open up the scrolls? Who can open them up? And then in Revelation 5, 9, it says, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy and to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, out of every tongue and people and nation. And verse 12, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength and honor, glory and blessing. I want you to understand Jesus is worth every sacrifice. He's worth every act of love. He's worth every act of worship, every dollar spent, every mile driven, every minute given. He is worthy of everything that you possibly could give unto him. He doesn't not see those things and every cost. Nothing poured on Jesus is ever wasted. Well, this brings us to the last point here. And it says, leave her alone. In verse 7, Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the, the day of my burial. For the poor you have always with, have with you, but you do not always have me. Jesus He's sort of, he's implying sort of with these words to Judas, as he sort of reprimands him here, he says, Judas, I don't want you to infect Mary with your words, and I want you to back off of her, okay? Leave her alone. It's not social distancing or physically distancing, it's spiritually distancing. Judas, I don't want you to have anything to do with her. Let her alone. Stay away, save lives, people. Stay away, <laughs> don't contaminate her faith and her passion. Judas, you be quiet. Let her get on with what she is doing for my burial because she is serving. You know, Jesus wants her to keep her thrill. He wants her to keep her gratitude, her awe of Jesus. He wants her to keep her amazement. He wants her to keep her wonder, her love. Don't allow anything to quench the raw, extravagant love and passion that you have for Jesus. If any voice, people, if any voice tells you to moderate your love for Jesus, don't listen to it. You know, there's, in our life, there's times we go through hardship. We may, some people might face a death. They might feel, face a divorce, either their divorce or a divorce of their parents. They go through some difficult, um, hard situations. And there are things in this life that we're trying to gnaw away to diminish our passion for Jesus. And it is the voice of betrayal. And it, at that voice, it is trying to say, hey, let go. Don't hold on to God and all that you're going through. Well, God is saying, pleading, hey, don't do that. Get away from her. And I think there is even something where Jesus is saying, speaking into the spiritual realm at this time, leave her alone. Leave her alone. Don't let that, that thought of those demonic realms grab a hold of her. Let it be ripped off of her. You know, uh, some people will always try to deflect and say, well, what, what about the poor? You know, what about uh, this? What about that? You know, Jesus is saying, hey, right now, in this time, in this moment, hey, what needs to happen is there needs to be a lavish worship and pouring out of, of one's heart, life, and service for, my, for, for me. 
And he says, hey, there are going to be times and there are going to be moments and other opportunities along the way where you can uh, minister to the poor, where you can alleviate them and elevate them from their circumstances and situations. There always is going to be a place where you can minister to needy people. But I want you to hear this right now. There, you need to take and make most of the opportunity that the Lord puts before you, whether that be in your devotion time, when you're alone at the house and you're reading your Bible, or a time where you just have a free time just to worship or sing in your car, or there is a time when you are at church, uh, in our socially distanced church, you know, but there is a place there where it says, hey, now's the time. I need to pour my love out with everything I have because there is one who is worthy of all praise, honor, glory, and worth everything that I have within me. And I, he deserves my praise, and I need to pour out my heart and my life to him forever and ever. It's a beautiful thing, people, when the worth of Jesus and the love of his followers match. The, the Lord's grace has touched every one of our lives. Lord, there. His mercy and His uh, grace is there. And we are just to walk in that, hey, break the flask, people. Pour out your love to Jesus. Pour out your heart and soul to Him. Let me pray for you today. Father, I just thank you uh, right now uh, for Rock Point Church. I thank you for every life, every soul. Lord, I'm thankful that the grace of God has intercepted and intervened into our lives. Lord, we were dead in trespasses and sin. You have made us alive in Christ Jesus. Lord, we are so thankful. Lord, we were outcasts, but you have brought us into your, your family through Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for new creation life. Lord, I pray right now for all of us, Lord, that we would bask in the wonder of Jesus. And that every one of us would pour out our hearts, our lives, our being in total devotion with extravagant affection, with a total display of honoring and worshiping you with everything we have. Lord, we love you and we want to serve you all the days of our, our lives by, by your help. In the name of Jesus, everybody said... Amen. Well, God bless you today. Love one another. Grace of God be with you. See you next week at church, God willing. If not, we'll, you'll watch us online again on live stream. God bless you.